Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. I'm Armand Georgian at the European Parliament in Brussels. Decision time is approaching on a key question of food safety, which also happens to be one of Europe's most toxic political issues. On October the 25th, a committee of experts is set to make up its mind about glyphosate, a chemical component found in the most widely used weed killer in the world. Glyphosate, the chemical, had been linked to cancer, but earlier this year it was judged safe for public use by the European Chemical Agency. However, some consumer protection advocates accused the agency of not being neutral and of suppressing evidence of a link to cancer. In May, the Committee of European Experts could not reach a decision whether to relicense glyphosate for 10 years. One thing is for sure, this controversy has split governments, regulators and scientists. To discuss it, I'm joined uh, by two guests, uh, the Danish MEP Margrethe Auken. Hello, welcome to you. Uh, Margrethe Auken is a member of the Group of the Greens and she sits on the Committee for Food Safety, Public Health and the Environment. I'm also joined by Bernard Uhl, Executive Director of the European Food Safety Authority. Hello, Hello. nice Hi. to meet you. Uh, EFSA was set up by uh, the EU institutions to carry out scientific risk assessments on food safety matters. Uh, it gave a positive recommendation for glyphosate, but insists it is not for or against the reauthorization of glyphosate per se. Um, let me start with you, uh, Margrethe Alken. Uh, how do you see things developing then uh, on the 25th of October? Are we heading towards a reauthorization of this uh, controversial chemical or not? I don't know, uh, because uh, still, a very bad thing in, in, in EU is that our governments are working secret. We don't have the needed transparency, which is very bad for democracy. It's very bad for national parliaments. They cannot follow the government. And that's also the case for these committees because they're representing their governments. And up till now, we, you know, we get conflicting uh, announcements. Sometimes we hear a government saying, well, we are against and for long, and then we have the feeling they're doing the opposite. We don't know. I hope we get an, a, a no to this a dramatic prolongation. So is Mr. Earl um, an ally or not in the uh, search for transparency? Well, he should be an ally, <laughs> but uh, we've had some troubles, to put it nice, uh, where, where uh, some of our agencies, and that uh, goes for EFSA too, think that uh, taking care of industry's secrecy is more important than making uh, public access. And of course, that is totally unacceptable in my point of view. Uh, and we also have in the EU fundamental uh, you know, rights that, uh, that uh, environment and human health is overriding uh, uh, industry. And I hope that we will soon get, get also EFSA into the narrow uh, track of, 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 of virtue. At EFSA, we love transparency. It's one of our core values. It's one of the driving values for our strategy transparency and even going further engagement. Mm -hmm. However, we are in the hand of the parliament because we follow a legal framework. And the legal framework has been set up by the two legislators, the, the parliament and the council. And this legal framework defines the balance between what we can publish and what of the data that industry is providing us is to be kept confidential because of intellectual property rights. So you'd be doing something illegal if you acceded to the full degree of transparency that Margrethe Auken is talking about. Yeah, the industry would sue us because we would infringe their rights of confidentiality and of data protection. So data protection in the sense of intellectual property rights. So we have to find the right balance. We publish as much as possible. You find on glyphosate 6,000 pages of background material on EFSA's website. We have given out to the members of the parliament following a public access to document request 10,000s of pages of raw data, but we cannot publish unless we have a legal framework. We would be the first one to publish, to make everything visible, because we don't like this uh, accusation of doing secret the, science. The, the law has some yes. limits on transparency. That's no, a fair point, isn't I it? I disagree. OK. Uh, there's just recently been a ruling also from the ECDA uh, that uh, if we had the uh, access, the right to information, and this 6,000 pages, you know, if you just send this in the face of people, and even in secret rooms where they're considering their reading like this is the same as, you know, it's, it's nonsense and it's cheating. I think you agree on that. And we had also, you know, our ombudsman 
Uh, we could have gone to the ombudsman also because he helped us uh, when it was EMA, the uh, medical in the agency. And it is clear in our laws. But there might be too many maps who have been lobbied by industry to, to, to take this track. But we have taken, sorry, EFSA mm. to the court again also here, to make sure that we have this uh, transparency. And for me, transparency is not 6,000 pages uh, in the head. Just a question about um, the degree of disclosure and what the law says. Uh, as you know, there was a slightly controversial uh, risk assessment done by uh, your authority in 2015 and uh, there were some passages which were identical to an industry report. Did you not source this to industry because that's the law or because EFSA didn't want to mention that it came from an industry? <clears throat> if you refer to the glyphosate assessment... Yeah, November 2015. Yeah. ...that we finalised in November 2015 yeah. with our <laughs> final conclusions, um, and uh, if I understood you correctly, you refer to an allegation if, if, as if there would have been a copy and paste yes. from industry data to mm. the data used by the regulatory authorities. Uh, this is just wrong. And I think it's, it's, it's a good opportunity to clarify this. We are working here on an application procedure and by law the applicant has to provide a set of studies that allow the regulators to assess the safety and they have to provide also the summary of these studies. Yeah. And then the rapporteur member state, which in this case was Germany, assesses this information and if the rapporteur member state thinks this is information is factually correct, the rapporteur member state can take this information, include it into his uh, okay, assessment okay. report. For, uh, let's say it, it, you're, you're saying it's the responsibility of the, of the German entity, but shouldn't it then have said uh, at least in a footnote, this is coming from an industry report, not from the EFSA, not from EFSA itself, not from EFSA's own research. No, uh, sorry, I think we are, we are confusing here a few things. This step in the assessment of, of an active substance that the rapporteur member state looks at the application is before EFSA gets involved. And I'm not... I'm not trying to, to give anything to the German authorities. The German authorities have done a very proper, thorough job in assessing the application brought forward by the applicant. And this assessment, the, the mm. reauthorization assessment report, then undergoes what we call a peer review by all 28 member states. So the Danish Environmental Protection Agency was one of the authorities agreeing with EFSA well, well, this yeah. still goes to what you said before about your outside all of this, yeah, and yeah. it's confusing. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not that outside. Not that outside, but no. you don't know all the procedures that are being used. Well, whatever. It's not, it's not, it's not open in the air. It cannot right. be discussed. And it's even less open to members of the general public. Yes, even less. I disagree. Less. Yeah, you might say you disagree, but we cannot get you. You know, the 6,000 pages is not a way of giving transparency, and please don't say that, because I will get all the public on my side when you, side, when you try to say you have full transparency with 6,000 pages. Read I'm into. not saying that this is the only mean of transparency. No, but, but, but what I would want to say, we want, and I think we have the ECDA, you know, the, the Court of Justice, they have ruled in November six, last year, uh, once, and now we hope they will rule again, that it is clear, and I think it's clear in our... Uh, our transparency legislation, 1049, it's clear in the, in the uh, treaty that health and environment, human health and environment, has an overriding uh, position to industry's secrecy uh, interests. And that has been said several times. And again and again and again, we are facing that our agencies are not following that. And I could add here, for me, it's not only a question of transparency, which, of course, I think is really lacking. Because we cannot get... We see it from many of the agencies. ECHAD is the same, you know, the chemical industry. Uh, you know, we see the same. And secondly, conflict of interest. I have, I have seen again that our agencies, authorities, think that it's enough to, to make a declaration. Conflict of interest must not be there. Yes, I fully agree. Yeah, but and please... we make sure that it's not happening. OK, so we... make are... sure that conflicts of interest, which is a very important as element of independence yes, of yes. science, yes. and we are the first advocates for a sound and independent science, but we work with the experts from the member states, that's legally foreseen, 
and the experts from the member states, they can work with universities, they do research. So, so we have to make sure that they are not brought into a conflictual situation. Sure. But no, but it's not only, sorry, you know, as, as, so, I'm, I'm very tough there because I have to, been in so long time. I'm old, I'm older this year. And I have seen that it's, you know, even if they are on the, some way on the payment somewhere of privileges or whatever from the industry, you can see it on their decisions. Even if they are kept out of it. And there we need the transparency to secure and save the public. And we also need much more strict on this. It's not enough. Also, Danish authorities, I'm not talking about Denmark being perfect here, I can assure you. Uh, we are having this battle at home too. Uh, and uh, I think it would be so helpful for, for all of us and for the trust to the EU if uh, we have this no, 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 no nonsense. Uh, of course, we can bring our experts and they can have a public debate and we can hear what do that, that person say, what does that person say. And on this background say, what is the decision to be said, taken here? Okay. Because there is this conflict between the UN and the EU. And there, you might say UN... No, I would not say that. No, I know you wouldn't say no, it, but... I, I, they just have looked at different evidence because they don't look mm. at studies that are not published. And we legally are obliged and we look into the raw data that the industry has to provide. That's the process that has been decided by the parliament in 2009. And we have to follow that. And from my point of view, it's the most transparent process globally. You will not find a more transparent process in assessing agrochemicals than we do in Europe. And I, I think we should also be proud of that. Yeah. Can we improve it? Yes, we can improve it. But there we need the legislator and we need a political debate. It's yeah. not a scientific debate. It's absolutely. a political debate. I and there we need agree. your support. I absolutely agree. And you will get all the support if you want it, honestly. <laughs> yes, we and want I it. And I absolutely agree that we are far ahead of FDA in the United States for conflict of interest. It's wrong. They are soaked in it. Uh, uh, and you know that. It's clear openly. And, uh, but I will also still say that I follow my member, you know, I'm not following this file in here, which means that it is bad stars or who it could be. Yes. And uh, they tell me that they cannot take this in, in the open debate, ask experts here and we can follow. And, but I will so much help you if that really will be on your, your uh, wish here. And we, uh, then we could both hope we have a clear uh, ruling from the, uh, from the European Court of Justice to make sure that we never ever again come into a situation where there can be raised just a minor doubt on the independency of the... Uh, yeah, of the... It's, it's in our vital interest to have these opportunities yeah. to do that. Yeah. Actually, we have given to the four MEBs, as you know, the information in a way that they could redo the assessment. They have hired two experts to redo the assessment. I, I... So. Yeah, I, 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 not I want yeah. to come on to that. Is it likely that there will be a, 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 a demand for a new assessment um, after October the 25th? Are you, are you preparing for that eventuality or uh, is everyone sort of satisfied with the existing assessments? Well, from my point of view, EFSA, together with 27 member states, it was only Sweden who had uh, a doubt on, on one aspect. EFSA, 27 member states, the European chemical agencies, the authorities in the US, in Canada, in New Zealand, in Japan, in Australia, they, and the WHO itself, mm. they all come to the same conclusion. With the information we have now, it's not necessary to classify glyphosate as cancerogenic. So all, except IAC, come to the same conclusion. So there's no need, from my point of view, to redo the assessment. It's this? done. The science is done. Now it's time for politics. I might have misunderstood. I thought there was some uh, adverse uh, comments from the WHO saying it was likely cancer gene. Yes, the WHO has two branches that work on the same topic. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, IRC, yeah. that classified as a probable carcinogen. And there's the WHO meeting on pesticides, experts, and they said no cancerogenicity. And then again, I would like so much to have a clear public debate on that, where I can see what happens with medicine, how much it helps when we have institutes within medicine as the Cochrane's, uh, who can really go into, yeah. you know, independent research, yeah. and we need it so much here too. OK, we're going to have to continue this debate on transparency another time, because clearly it's a very long one. I'd like to thank uh, my guests, and uh, for now, it's time for our fact-checking segment on European news. This week, Frédéric Simon, a journalist at Euractiv, looks at manipulation and disinformation in the Catalan crisis.
This week, we return to the police violence that marred the independence referendum in Catalonia. It was at the beginning of October, the world discovered with shock the images of violence in Catalonia, which for the most part were very real. However, some of the pictures that circulated on the internet were either fake or misleading. Like this picture of a crowd carrying a Catalan flag. Some presented it on Twitter as a possible candidate for the Pulitzer Prize. Well, it turns out it was a simple collage. The crowd was real, but the flag was added later on. Other pictures of police violence circulating on Twitter were authentic, but deliberately misleading, like this video, which dates back to 2012. According to the Spanish daily El País, most of these pictures originated from Twitter accounts in Russia, which saw their activity jump by more than 2,000% after the referendum. Those tweets were quickly relayed by internet media outlets in the US, like Infowars or The Drudge Report, which are close to far-right circles and loyal to Donald Trump. The editorial line of these websites is clear. They tend to favor conspiracy theories and are particularly keen on stories that underline divisions among European countries. Well, thanks again to uh, Margrethe Auken. Thanks for being here. And Bernard Ull from EFSA. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And don't go away because our one-to-one -one interview is coming up in just a few moments here on Talking Europe.